Hello and welcome to the Life Tools podcast. In school, we learned history and algebra, foreign languages and chemistry, but nobody taught us tools for life. How do we deal with self-doubt? What are beliefs and how do they influence us? How do we find ourselves when we feel lost? And how do we make a healthy decision? Many people learn these things much later in life, after three, four, even five decades of existence, and often the hard way. For a few, like myself, I had to learn them very early. I created this podcast to share with you the tools that have helped me greatly in my own life. They're small actions anybody can take that bring big results over time. Let's get to it. Hello everyone, I hope you all had a great weekend. In my neck of the woods, it's been pleasantly cool and rainy and I'm savoring every moment of this perfect cozy weather before summer comes. I ended last week's episode with a poem from Khalil Gibran. The title of this poem is On Children and you will find it along with his other writings in the book titled The Prophet, which I highly recommend you read. His writing is moving and profound and life-changing if you allow the meaning behind the words to really soak in. Here is my interpretation of the poem. Parents, you do not own your children. They were born from your flesh and blood, but they, like you and everyone else, are souls living this physical experience. Their souls have a history and a purpose for this particular lifetime, a purpose that is sacredly entwined with yours. You, more than anybody else in the world, have the power to shape them, to influence how they see themselves and how they see life. So strive to be well, because in being well, you transmit wellness to your children. Love them, care for them, but do not try to force them into a mold, because this mold that you believe in was shaped by your past, and they are headed for the future. You yourselves needed to be different from your parents, because you too were born for a future that your parents couldn't know about. Your role in your child's life is very important. Do not take it lightly. Do not underestimate your influence. Go about it with an open heart and the humility to know that though your children's bodies are small, their souls are old and you have as much to learn from them as they do from you. This poem talks to parents, but the philosophy applies to everyone. I am not a parent myself, but what he says resonates with me and I use it as one of my many guiding principles every single time I am in contact with a child, whether that is as a teacher, as a tutor, a babysitter, or as a friend of their parents. I don't think it is possible to change our perspective on children and our role in their lives without changing our perspective on life itself and why we are here, on our deeper, beyond-the-surface relationship with each other, and on what comes before and after life. Let me explain. Our beliefs about anything affect our attitude towards that thing, and our attitude is what determines what actions we take. Whatever we do from the big things to the small things can always be traced back to our beliefs, which then goes to show that if we wish to change the way we do things, for example, the way we deal with children or the way we work or how we give in relationships, we must go back to the root, our beliefs. If you address only the action part, it will change nothing about how you feel, so it's not going to be sustainable. I know that for some, you don't own your children is very triggering to hear, but do know that, as I mentioned, this principle applies to every one of us, including myself. We adults do not own children. I insist again and again on the importance of this principle because when we have the attitude that we own our children, we become supremely pissed when they do things that we do not like or is out of the norm for us. We think they should be like us because they are extensions of us. It's thanks to us that they are even alive and therefore they must pay us back by pleasing us. Imagine a couple, both doctors, both from very scientifically inclined families, both very left-brained and logical who think left-brained and logical is the only right way to be. And then they give birth to a daughter who hates school and wants nothing but to draw and sing and play with colors. Now, these parents are of the firm opinion that there is no future in art. 
They sincerely believe in this stereotype of the starving artist and think that science is superior to art. They love their daughter, and the last thing they want is for her to end up living a life of financial struggle. Being famously successful in their field, they also secretly fear that their daughter will not amount to anything and then what will people say? That they are bad parents? So, operating from their belief that their child must be a certain way, that she came purely from them with no past and no future encoded in her DNA, then what do you think they're going to do? They're going to do everything in their power to squash the artist in this child. They will tell her drawing is useless, art is frivolous, and artists live miserable lives. They will take away her art materials, tell her to sit down and do her homework. They will threaten and bribe just to get her to put more effort in school. They will yell at her if she keeps drawing when she's supposed to be doing math. They will compare her to other children who are getting A's. They will keep her away from people who love art lest they reignite her passion. In the same breath, they will also tell her that they love her and that this is all for her own good. And this child will suffer. She will feel pain to the depths of her soul because she feels unaccepted. She will think there is something wrong with her for loving color so much. She will try with all her might to be like her parents and each time she will die a little inside because this is not who she is. This is not what her soul came to be. She is an adult now and still when she's around her parents, she never feels good enough for them. She loves them, wants to get close to them, but can't because she's different and they don't like different. Now imagine a second set of parents, similar to the first. They are also scientifically minded and have a child who loves to draw. But they hold the belief that their child came through their flesh and blood, but she has her own purpose to live. And this purpose is revealed little by little by the things she is attracted to, by the stuff she is pulled towards, the same way opposite poles of a magnet are pulled towards each other. Instead of watching daily to see if she's staying within the normal mold, they watch her with delight and curiosity, encouraging her to be herself, to draw and to keep drawing, keep improving because they see that each time she's with her art materials, she is alive. And even though sometimes she's not happy with her work and she can get disappointed, she keeps going back to her art desk. She cannot be stopped. It's okay if she got a C in math. In their mind, they have a child whose intelligence lies in the arts and this is just as legit as mathematical intelligence. By the way, if you haven't listened to episode number 12 titled The Theory of Multiple Intelligences, I encourage you to do so as it will give context to what I'm saying here. So this child will grow up to be emotionally healthy, confident, and happy. Very likely she will also become a successful artist because after the thousands of hours she was allowed to spend practicing her skills, she will have gotten really good at her craft. If you ask her about her success, she'll tell you she's very grateful to have parents who have always, always supported her, who trusted her who were there for her through the ups and downs. She knows she wouldn't be where she is now if it weren't for everything they have done to help her. To this day, she maintains a very close relationship with them. In these two examples, both parents love their child with all their heart, but they have different beliefs and therefore different actions and different consequences. Look around you. This dynamic between parent and child is everywhere, even though the details may not be the same. We could be talking about a homosexual child born to highly religious parents who think homosexuality is a sin, or a naturally rebellious child born to extremely conformist parents, or an introverted child born to parents who do not even know what introversion is and think their child might have a psychological disorder or a singer born to a family of doctors, like Wang Li Hong, one of the most famous American-born Taiwanese singers. It could be a child with psychic abilities born to parents who think only what can be physically seen and touched is true, and so their child is completely out of the norm. How does this apply to people who are not parents? If you are a teacher and you think adults own children, then you're going to try to whip your students into shape. If a child doesn't do well in your class, you're going to think they're lazy and they must be disciplined. Instead of watching with curiosity what gifts they might have within them, you're going to tell them they are slow, they are bad because they're not following what you say. 
You will yell at them, confiscate their colored pencil, put them on timeout, punish them, humiliate them in front of the entire class, and you will think you are doing the right thing. If you are at your friend's place and you hear your friend complaining that all her son Patrick wants to do is play basketball, you're going to face Patrick and try to encourage him to spend less time on basketball and more time on school lessons because school is everything. School is our doorway to a bright future. Basketball is useless. Basketball will not put food on the table. You will talk to him with a friendly smile, but what you're really saying is what he likes is not okay. What he is, is not okay. I don't know if you remember being a child. I do. I remember that my parents' approval meant the entire world to me, which also meant that their disapproval had the power to cut me in half. Kids want the approval of the adults around them. The closer they are to someone, the more attached they are to the approval from that person. So it makes sense that if you are a parent, you are the most influential person in your child's life. When I talk about approval and disapproval, I do not mean just in words. Children are very, very sensitive. When we say one thing but our overall attitude says another thing, like when we're being passive-aggressive, children can feel it, even though they may not verbalize it. So here is my invitation for you this week. Ask yourself what you believe about children. How has this been influencing how you act? Could you entertain the thought that you don't own your children? How can you use this new thought to inform how you interact with them? I hope you found this episode helpful. I can tell you that for me, when I came upon this information in my teens, it was as if the heavens opened up and I finally understood something very, very deep. And I will be completely honest with you. To work with children from this belief is not the most convenient. It is easier to force them to do what we want. It's easier to lose our temper. It's easier to threaten. But nothing can ever compare to the happiness that I feel when I see a child bloom, when I see their confidence grow, when I hear them able to laugh more when they used to be so stiff and full of fear. And so it requires me to be self-aware to admit that I am not always right, to keep going back to the principles. If you have any questions or wish to share anything, send me a message at lifetoolspodcast at gmail.com. That is lifetoolspodcast without the word the. Have a great week, everyone, and thank you for listening. Bye.